Namaste. The Art of Happiness, a Handbook for Living by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Harvard C. Cutler. Part 1. The Purpose of Life. Chapter 1. The Right to Happiness. I believe that the very purpose of our life is to seek happiness. That is clear. Whether one believes in religion or not, whether one believes in this religion or that religion, we all are seeking something better in life. So, I think the very motion of our life is towards happiness. With these words spoken before a large audience in Arizona, the Dalai Lama cut to the heart of his message. But his claim that the purpose of life was happiness raised a question in my mind. Later, when we were alone, I asked, Are you happy? Yes, he said. He paused, then added, Yes, definitely. There was a quiet sincerity in his voice that left no doubt, a sincerity that was reflected in his expression and in his eyes. But is happiness a reasonable goal for most of us? I asked. Is it really possible? Yes, I believe that happiness can be achieved through training the mind. On a basic human level, I couldn't help but respond to the idea of happiness as an achievable goal. As a psychiatrist, however, I had been burdened by notions such as Freud's belief that one feels inclined to say that the intention that man should be happy is not included in the plan of creation. This type of training has led many in my profession to the grim conclusion that the most one could hope for was the transformation of hysteric misery into common unhappiness. From that standpoint, the claim that there was a clearly defined path to happiness seemed like quite a radical idea. As I look back over my years of psychiatric training, I could rarely recall having heard of the word happiness even mentioned as a therapeutic objective. Of course, there was plenty of talk about relieving the patient's symptoms of depression or anxiety, of resolving internal conflicts or relationship problems, but never with the expressly stated goal of becoming happy. The concept of achieving true happiness has, in the West, always seemed ill-defined, elusive, ungraspable. Even the word happy is derived from the Icelandic, Icelandic word hap, meaning luck or chance. Most of us, it seems, share this view of the mysterious nature of happiness. In those moments of joy that life brings, Happiness feels like something that comes out of the blue. To my western mind, it didn't seem the sort of thing that one could develop and sustain simply by training the mind. When I raised that objection, the Dalai Lama was quick to explain. When I say training the mind, in this context, I am not referring to mind merely as one's cognitive ability or intellect. Rather, I am using the term in the sense of the Tibetan word Sem, which has a much broader meaning, closer to psych or spirit. It includes intellect and feeling, heart and mind. By bringing about a certain inner discipline, we can undergo a transformation of our attitude 
our entire outlook and approach to living when we speak of this inner discipline it can of course involve many things many methods but generally speaking one begins by identifying those factors which lead to happiness and those factors which lead to suffering having done this one then sets about gradually eliminating those factors which lead to suffering and cultivating those which lead to happiness that is the way the dalai lama claims to have found some measure of personal happiness and throughout the week he spent in arizona i often witnessed how this personal happiness can manifest as a simple willingness to reach out to others to create a feeling of affinity and goodwill even in the briefest of encounters one morning after his public lecture the dalai lama was walking along an outside portico on the way back to his hotel room surrounded by his usual retinue noticing one of the hotel housekeeping staff standing by the elevators he paused to ask her where are you from for a moment she appeared taken aback by this foreign looking man in the maroon robes and seemed puzzled by the deference of the entourage then she smiled and answered shyly mexico he paused briefly to chat with her for a few moments and then walked on leaving her with a look of excitement and pleasure on her face the next morning at the same time she appeared at the same spot with another of the housekeeping staff and the two of them greeted him warmly as he got into the elevator the interaction was brief but the two of them appeared flushed with happiness as they returned to work every day after that they were joined by a few more of the housekeeping staff at the designated time and place until by the end of the week there were dozens of maids in their crisp gray and white uniforms forming a receiving line that stretched along the length of the path that led to the elevators our days are numbered at this very moment many thousands are born into the world some destined to live only a few days or weeks and then tragically succumb to illness or other misfortune others are destined to push through to the century mark perhaps even a bit beyond and savor every taste life has to offer triumph despair joy hatred and love we never know but whether we live a day or a century a central question always remains what is the purpose of our life what makes our lives meaningful the purpose of our existence is to seek happiness it seems like common sense and western thinkers from aristotle to william james have agreed with this idea but isn't a life based on seeking personal happiness by nature self-centered even self-indulgent not necessarily in fact survey after survey has shown that it is unhappy people who tend to be most self-focused and are often socially withdrawn brooding and even antagonistic happy people in contrast are generally found to be more sociable flexible and creative and are able to tolerate life's daily frustrations more easily than unhappy people and most important they are found to be more loving and forgiving than unhappy people researchers have devised some interesting experiments demonstrating that happy people exhibit a certain quality of openness a willingness to reach out and help others 
They managed, for instance, to induce a happy mood in a test subject by arranging to have the person unexpectedly find money in a phone booth. Posing as a stranger, one of the experimenters then walked by and accidentally dropped a load of papers. The investigators wanted to see whether the subject would stop to help the stranger. In another scenario, the subject's spirits were lifted by listening to a comedy album. Then they were approached by someone in need, wanting to borrow money. The investigators discovered that the subjects who were feeling happy were more likely to help someone or to lend money than another. Control group of individuals who were presented with the same opportunity to help but whose mood had not been boosted ahead of time. While these kinds of experiments contradict the notion that the pursuit and achievement of personal happiness somehow leads to selfishness and self-absorption, we can all conduct our own experiment in the laboratory of our own daily lives. Suppose, for instance, we are stuck in a traffic. After 20 minutes, it finally begins moving again at around parade speed. We see someone in another car signaling that she wants to pull into our lane ahead of us. If we are in a good mood, we are more likely to slow down and wave her on ahead. If we are feeling miserable, our response may be simply to speed up and close the gap. Well, I have been stuck here waiting all this time. Why shouldn't they? We begin then with the basic premise that the purpose of our life is to seek happiness. It is a vision of happiness as a real objective, one that we can take positive steps toward achieving. And as we begin to identify the factors that lead to a happier life, we will learn how the search for happiness offers benefits not only for the individual but for the individual's family and for society at large as well. Thank you.